Uh, welcome everyone, the, the speaker to today's uh, Eleftherios uh, Soltanis is going to talk about the homotopic plateau Douglas problem. Go ahead. Thank you, Enrico. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to present my slides here. Um, yes, so this is joint work with uh, Stefan Wenger and um, it's on the homotopic plateau Douglas problem. So, okay, here's the outline. So first I'm gonna talk a little bit about the classical plateau Douglas problem, then explain some homotopic variants, go to the metric setting where we, which is the one novelty of, of our, of what we did. Um, and then after reviewing the um, necessary background, um, move to the homotopic plateau douglas problem in the metric setting okay so the plateau douglas problem is a generalization of the famous plateau problem where you're asked to span a minimal disk uh, of, of minimal area or a disk of minimal area and so in the plateau douglas problem you replace one jordan curve by k Jordan cur curves in some ambient space. And you are looking for maps from a given surface with a given number k of boundary components. And in my talk, uh, I'll always assume that k is at least one. So the same methods actually, you, with the same methods, you can treat the boundary less case as well. That will be k equal to zero, but today I won't really talk about that. Um, and uh, looking for a, an area minimizing map from this, from a given surface. So meaning that you fix the number of boundary components and you fix the genus of the surface. Okay, and just a very quick word. So, and this is not exhaustive at all, but uh, this was, th this generalized plateau problem was first considered by Douglas and Rado, or f first shown that, uh, um, you can, it's solvable. And then uh, in, in um, manifolds, in some kind of homogeneously regular manifolds by Lemaire and Yost. And um, recently uh, building on work of Litzak and Wenger, that was about the plateau problem itself. Uh, Fitzy Wenger, so Martin and Stefan, uh, proved an analogous result for in, in singular metric spaces. Um, assert, so that those are certain kinds of metric spaces. And um, so these singular metric spaces will be spaces with a local quadratic isoparametric inequality that I'll explain a bit later. And these include, so they include all compact manifolds and this class of homogeneously regular manifolds and also, for example, Alexandrov spaces. Um, and um, the main, so the results typically assume this um, condition, so-called Douglas condition. And uh, after imposing that, are able to show that this plateau Douglas problem is solvable. What's the Douglas condition? Take a surface with K boundary components, that's compact, smooth, and oriented. And um, to define the Douglas condition, you first have to know what are primary reductions. So what you do is you take your surface and uh, you construct a new surface M star by first cutting M along or yeah, along a simple non-contractible loop in the interior of your surface. And now you have uh, two new boundary components. So M, M minus alpha has two new boundary components and you glue two smooth disks so that you, uh, after the gluing, you still have a, a smooth compact oriented manifold. And uh, this is typically denoted by M star, this primary reduction. And uh, so just, for the next thing, a bit of terminology. So we say that a map spans this gamma, which is a collection of K, a disjoint uh, collection of K Jordan curves in, in an ambient space. 
if um, the boundary, so U restricted to the boundary is, is a, a uniform limit of homeomorphisms. Uh, yeah. And uh, now let little a of M gamma denote the minimal area of maps spanning gamma, right? So this is basically the quantity that we are interested in and want to, to minim to, so to show that there exists a minimizer. And then for comparison, uh, denote by a star M gamma, the minimum of the, 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 the minimum of the infimal areas over all primary reductions of M. So you compare, so here you compare uh, the minimal area you need to, to span this gamma from your surface and the minimal area or infimal area you need to fill it with any of these primary reductions. And we say that the Douglas condition is satisfied if it's strictly better to fill it in M than it is to fill it in the with any or to fill span gamma with any of these um, primary maps from a primary reduction. Okay, so here's a picture. So the M here is on the left hand side, and in the, the, the upper example, this curve alpha is, uh, yeah, goes around, and then you cut along it and you attach these smooth disks which I've drawn in, in red here on the left hand side in yes in red and so this here would be an M star and uh, in the lower picture there's yet another thing so here when you do this cutting you end up with something that is disconnected right and then but but you can it doesn't have to be disconnected so what can also happen is that you might be cutting along an alpha like this and now you simply put these caps, so these, these disks in here, and uh, the, the surface stays connected. Okay, and so there's a, a slight, I, I define primary reductions like this, even though, for example, uh, Martin and Stefan define them a little bit otherwise. So for example, what could happen is that, imagine this boundary component wasn't here, so that this guy was just closed. But then when you took this M star, you would end up with this component plus, this component, which has no boundary, would have no boundary if this guy didn't have a boundary. And uh, Stefan and Martin in, in their paper uh, discarded this component. But in fact, it, it kind of doesn't matter for the, for the Plateau-Douglas problem because um, you can define any map on this boundary-less component to just be a constant map. So it won't affect the area of this A star. And um, so here's yet yeah, a picture of, of the Douglas condition. So imagine that, so this is just a very simple thing. Imagine that your bound, your manifold was just a cylinder and uh, you have an ambient space R3 and you have, uh, so two examples of what gamma might be. So gamma not here on, on the upper hand, on the upper side is uh, these two, uh, two, just two standard curves that are kind of large and sort of close uh, to each other, okay? And now the other option is you make the gamma smaller or and, and far further away from, from each other. So in the upper example, the, the, you, minimize the, so the, you minimize the area by joining these by these blue lines, right? So this is just, so, so here the, the minimal area will be, um, just the area of this, of the blue cylinder. Um, and that will be smaller than if you filled the disks. Whereas in the lower example, it's better, it takes less area to fill the disks separately. So notice that if you look at M, a primary reduction of M is when you cut, take, take alpha in the, in the center here and just add the caps. So a primary reduction is actually uh, two copies of disk of a disk or diffeomorphic two copies of, of the disk, right? So 
this here represents the situation where this uh, A star will be will not be strictly bigger than than A because it, it takes it's uh, better to fill fill in like this than it is to fill it fully. Uh, notice that it's not true that A star will be strictly smaller than A because what you can always do is uh, you can kind of fill these and then attach a long, just a line here, a line segment connecting these two and, and then fill this one again. So this line segment will have zero area and it will be a map. So then you get a map from actually the cylinder. So the area will be the same as in, in a star, but the point is that it's not, so the area A M gamma is not strictly less than A star. And so this is the situation that this Douglas condition is preventing. If, if the Douglas condition is not satisfied, then it might not be possible to find an area minimizer like we do. So it's a necessary condition. Okay, so just to give you the classical Plato Douglas problem, um, so let X be a homogeneous irregular manifold. And um, roughly this just means that it has positive injectivity radius and, and bounded section curvature. I think that's not exactly what it means, but uh, it's good enough for, for this purpose. You can also think of X as just, just take a compact manifold. This will always be a homogeneously regular. Um, and uh, <clears throat> so the classical Plato Douglas problem tells you that, so you take a surface with K boundary components and uh, a co collection of K disjoint Jordan curves, gamma. So then there exists a map which spans gamma. So the boundary, uh, so you restricted the boundary of M is, is this um, parameterizes this gamma and uh, which has minimal area, okay? And uh, also there exists a Riemannian metric on M so that U is conformal in the interior. And here uh, conformal means in a, because the ambient space of course is not, is not uh, a planar domain, a planar domain or another surface. Uh, you cannot talk about conformal in the function theoretic sense, but, but it means this here. Um, and so here's just a very simple picture again of what can happen or what the, the solu solution to the Plato Douglas problem is. So you take a cylinder and here your ambient space is the torus and gamma consists of these two, two um, circles here that I've drawn on the left and right of the torus. And you simply span th this, this part or you could also like map the cylinder to this side. These would both be uh, minimizers, area minimizers here. Notice that in this case, um, there will be no, so if, if you consider a primary reduction, so the two disks here, uh, you, you will not be able to fill in the disks here because this torus is not the solid torus. So you cannot simply fill the disks like this. So yeah. Okay, and then say a few words about the homotopic invariant, variant, not invariant. Uh, so Joost asked to find um, an area minimum. Question. Yes? I would like to ask a question. Um, you said that this map is conformal, but what is the regularity of the map? Is it C1 or, I mean, the derivatives in which sense are they defined? Ah, so it's a smooth map in the interior. Oh, okay, but if it is a smooth map, can't I just uh, consider um, the 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 distance induced by the ambient and actually say that this map is on a for for some metric is is really an isometric embedding? So what you can do is you can um, you can factor the map through a surface, and then you really get a conformal map, and um, not an isometric embedding, but um, so so the the so you get something which might have branch points. 
so I mean, in the, these easy examples I draw, of course, this doesn't happen, but but in general, you you can have a, like branch points. So the, so basically, you get that you you can factor it through a map, uh, which which is kind of conformal in the classical sense outside of a finite set of points where the derivative might vanish, and mm. then yeah, uh -huh. so this this can happen. Okay, thanks. Uh, so Joost asked to find a conformal area minimizer, which not only is, you know is the spans gamma and is area minimal, but also you want to control uh, the topology of the map, so to speak. So you want to say that uh, I give you know you want to give a homomorphism typically induced by some other map, and you want to find an area minimizer where which induces this very homomorphism. Uh, and Lemaire did a uh, slightly, well, another variant. And um, he also asked for a smooth area minimizer, which is homotopic to a given map. So homotopic to a given map is uh, stronger than inducing the same homomorphism. So if, yeah, um, but homotopic through maps that span gamma. And uh, so the results say, say that, so this is, well, simple necessary conditions for, for the existence here is, for example, if H is injective uh, and, and for Lemaire's case, uh, if, if the second fundamental group of the, the ambient manifold vanishes and again, phi star, so the induced homomorphism is injective. So then, then you can actually always solve at least obtain solutions to these problems. And our goal is to consider, give yet another variant, um, which is called one homotopy. And um, it's defined by taking a triangulation of your, your surface M uh, and restricting the map to a one skeleton and then looking at the homotopy type of that one skeleton. And uh, what we want to do is prove existence of area minimizers in a given one homotopy class. So this one homotopy class will be something, be some notion between these two. It's stronger than this, but weaker than, than being homotopic. Um, and also this conformality or a variant that we'll use for quasi-conformality uh, is, is part of the, the statement we want because if you don't require this then there are many area minimizers which kind of don't want don't have the regularity properties you want such as this uh, two disks joined by a line okay so we want to do this in the metric setting. So let me try to explain a little bit what this metric setting is. And uh, then we might have a break and then I'll move on to the homotopic variant, explaining it more. Okay, so just to set up the, the situation. So we continue assuming that F is, Fm is a smooth compact oriented surface with K boundary components. And here I wrote it like this to emphasize that this means that the boundary is kind of homomorphic or diffeomorphic to um, uh, K disjoint copies of S1, right? And uh, here for the moment, let X be just some proper geodesic space and take a collection of disjoint, a disjoint collection of uh, K Jordan curves denoted by gamma in, in our ambient space. And uh, this, this map, the boundary values uh, were, that were required to be uniform limits of homeomorphisms. So a map like this is called a weak reparameterization of gamma. Um, <clears throat> because that means that the map, such a map doesn't need to be really a homeomorphism from the boundary to the Jordan curve but it can, so it can, for example, travel if, if, yeah, 
it can it can uh, stay constant on on some part and then continue. Yeah. Okay. And uh, what do I mean by Sobolev maps in with metric space targets? So this is needed because, of course, we when we formulate our result, we are formulating it in a in, a, in the context of Sobolev maps. Um, so a Sobolev map is defined as follows. So a map with a, met, a Borel map with targets in a with um, values in metric space is Sobolev if whenever you post compose it with a one Lipschitz map, the composition is in the classical normal Sobolev space on this open set, which is the interior of M. And moreover, the gradient of this composition is controlled by some L2 function. Okay. So this is just a uh, uh, a Resetniak definition of the Sobolev map. And there are many others as well, but for this talk, we will stick with this to this definition. The crucial things to know about Sobolev maps is that they admit a trace uh, and they have something called an approximate metric derivative, which I'll denote by up M and MD, or maybe I'll talk about or just pronounce it MD, so metric derivative of U. So the trace is, as you probably are aware, uh, just an L2 map on the boundary. Now the boundary, of course, is equipped with uh, the one-dimensional measure, Hausdorff measure, for example. And uh, the, the, the crucial property here is that you should think of it as the, the boundary values of U. So if U happens to be continuous as well, then the trace is just the, the restriction of u to the boundary. This is what we want. But then when u is not continuous, you kind of you, you cannot just define it as the restriction of the boundary because this is a null set. And of course, uh, you can change the values of a Sobolev map in a null set. Uh, so it, you cannot directly define it like this. But nevertheless, you can define this trace map, which will be an L2 from the boundary to the metric space, okay? And um, just for the sake of being definite here, let me let me um, define what it means to span a collection of curves. So Sobolev map spans this collection of curves gamma if the trace agrees almost everywhere with a weak reparameterization of gamma. So what's the difference here to the previous um, classical formulations is, just that I, I introduce this trace and talk about agreeing almost every. So what I want to say is that the boundary values are a weak reparameterization of gamma. But now, because I'm in the Sobolev world, I have to introduce this trace and talk about agrees almost everywhere with uh, with a weak reparameterization of gamma. And I will use this notation uh, quite a lot, I guess, in this talk. So lambda m gamma denotes just the, all the, the collection of all Sobolev maps which span gamma. And so here's a picture demonstrating that the, the weak reparameterization doesn't always need to be like a homeomorphism, so it can stay constant on, a, on some part of the boundary, but maybe I skip this. Um, and now the approximate metric derivative. So this is a semi-norm on the tangent space that exists for almost every point, z on the surface. And the, the crucial property of it is this, that uh, the approximate limit of this difference is zero. So what this means is that this approximate metric derivative is a seminorm. So when you plug in a vector from from your um, tangent space, you can. So the, the norm is given by the approximate limit uh, of this difference quotient. So this is uh, due to, I mean, due to Kirchheim for Lipschitz maps, and then then there is technical work to to uh, pass from Lipschitz maps to Sobolev maps and replace this. 
limit that would be in the Lipschitz case with an approximate limit. Dx written uh, after the exponential should be at z. Oh yes, that's true. Yes, sorry about that. That was a typo. Yes, should be a z, z absolutely. So oh, this um, seminorm, which I'll denote by s, corresponds to this seminorm where you look at the differential of a map and uh, just look at the seminorm v gets mapped to the the norm of of d u of the image of of v for, for smooth maps, right? So this is what it corresponds to because we cannot make it's more difficult to make sense of this differential of u but it is well easier to make sense of of this norm and this norm in fact already carries a lot of well a lot of metric information or all the metric information so to define area and energy what we want is to define substitutes for the determinant of the um differential and also the supreme the operator norm of the differential right and we define these by defining the Jacobian of the seminorm so this is if you think of d so du now would be a um, linear map and the determinant of du is just uh, the this factor you get when you look at when you compare the um the, the hausdorff so the, the measure of the image under that linear map and the measure of the set you began with. And we define the Jacobian here of a seminorm similarly. So here what this means is that you take the a the Hausdorff 2 measure with respect to the seminorm. Now the seminorm is a genuine seminorm, meaning that it's not a norm, so that it can vanish on a some non-zero uh, vector, then well you can you can still define this and it will turn out to give um, zero to every set, uh, or we can just define it to be zero. And if S is a norm, then in fact, this is a you know well-defined notion. Norm defines a metric, and then you look at the house of two measure with respect to that metric. And here the B2 could be replaced actually by any set of positive measure. And then you also define so replace the operator norm of the of this du by the maximum stretching of the norm somehow. Um, and as in the classical case, you all we always have this this inequality. So the Jacobian of the seminorm is always at most this maximum stretching squared. Uh, whereas if it so happens that you have the reverse inequality up to some constant k, then we say that the seminorm is quasi-conformal and a map is quasi-conformal if, if the associated seminorm is quasi-conformal for, for almost every point with, with the same k. Okay, so um, just a picture of what all this stuff means. So the norm in general, uh, can be doesn't have to be induced by an inner product so the norm the, the unit ball of the norm can look something like this i guess the, the black um, diamond here and um and what so this might be the norm and um so there is a thing called the john ellipse of of this of the unit ball of s so this is the the ellipse of maximal volume in this case area that fits inside this and it turns out that if you take this john ellipse so the ellipse of maximal area uh, then uh, enlarging it by a factor of square root two you will always contain your unit ball so this has this property that uh, when you when you multiplied by a factor of square root two, it, the, the, the result will encompass the unit ball. So that means that, so this unit ball of S defines the norm and the John ellipse defines another norm. And these two are comparable by a factor of square, square root two. 
And what this quasi-conformality of the norm means, roughly speaking, is when you look at this ellipse, uh, these, um, the, the ratio of the, these two axes has to be bounded. Here I write k prime because I think maybe the k, I mean, this upper bound doesn't need to be exactly k, but it's, should, it, it's some number that depends only on k. And on the right hand side, I have um, I have um, a picture of something called infinitesimally isotropic se seminorm. So imagine that the norm of your Sobolev map at, a, at some point is given by this almost square thing. Now, when you take the John ellipse, uh, it turns out to be a Euclidean circle. And in this case, we say that this, uh, this seminorm is infinitesimally iso or is isotropic. And we say that a Sobolev map is infinitesimally isotropic if for almost every point, uh, this, this seminorm is isotropic. So the John ellipse is a Euclidean ball or otherwise uh, this, this uh, seminorm is zero. So that can that we must also allow. And yeah. Okay. And infinitesimal isotropy is our substitute for for conformality. Okay. Um, what happens because of this fact that I told you that uh, the John ellipse times square root two will or, or the John ellipse, the norm defined by the John ellipse is comparable to this to, to the given norm. Uh, this means that um, the approximate metric derivative of an infinitesimally isotropic map is going to be too quasi-conformal. So this is infinitesimally isotropic is slightly better than saying that the map is quasi-conformal in this infinitesimal sense. And yeah, so th for those who know this causing conformality from other contexts the, this the notion here the, the notion we're um, introducing here is is uh, different it's in general much uh, weaker and it doesn't in and of itself imply any regularity properties um, without additional assumptions but it's nevertheless a a good way to to, to yeah to substitute conformality and in fact, this infinitesimal isotropy is just the same thing as saying conformal when in, in the classical case when the target is smooth and, and your map, for example, is smooth as well. Okay, so if the definition you yeah. gave on the, in the slide before, if the map is one quasi conformal, then is it uh, infinitesimally uh, or not? If, the map if is it's quasi conformal with this definition. So yeah, if it's if it's one quasi conformal, then I, I guess that that means that um, yeah, this this max yeah. So then then it means that it's it's uh, infinitesimally isotropic, yes. But it doesn't go the other way around. So infinitesimally isotropic is not one quasi conformal. C can you say a little bit why the inverse is not true? So here, here is a good example. This picture. So uh, a map which, which does this. So for example, you can consider the map um, uh, from so the identity map from the plane with um, with the L infinity metric to or norm to the just the Euclidean plane, right? And this will be infinitesimally isotropic, and it will be, I guess, too quasi conformal. Or it will be quasi-conformal, but it will not be one quasi-conformal. Okay, thank you. And, and what happens is exactly that, exactly, well, pretty much this picture. So in that case, the, the norm will be the, the square and the, the, the edge on ellipse inside it will always be a circle, uh, but it you will never, because of the fact that the norm, the, the, the approximate metric derivative if, is never going to be induced by an inner product, in that case, you will never recover one quasi-conformality. Perfect, perfect. Thanks. Thanks a lot. 
Yes. So with these, we're able to define the area and energy of a sub of mass. And these go as you might expect. So the area is uh, just the integral of the Jacobian of the approximate metric derivatives. And the energy is the integral of this maximal stretching squared. Um, by the way, one thing to mention is that this the integrand here without the square uh, is is what you could take as a as rho in the definition of a Sobolev map. So if, if u is a Sobolev map, then this rho in the definition that should majorize the gradients of all these post compositions, you can take it to be this map would send z to the maximal stretching of mdz u. Okay. So a couple of remarks. The area uh, is remains invariant under bilipsic homeomorphisms. This is because of these um, well nice composition properties of the Jacobian um, and of the metric derivative. And what this means in particular that uh, it's independent of the Riemannian metric you chose. Is there any two metrics, smooth metrics, otherwise? will be by Lipschitz equivalent and <clears throat> then the area won't change. So that's why there is no G here in, in when I write area of U because it in fact doesn't depend on G on the remaining metric. So the energy on the other hand is still uh, invariant under conformal homeomorphisms but not anymore on under any diffeomorphism and in particular not under by Lipschitz homeomorphisms and therefore, it depends on on the Riemannian metric, and that's that's what is shown here in the notation where you actually write the G. And this will be a, a point uh, to consider later on. And now, finally, we can define this local quadratic isoperimetric inequality that I will abbreviate by QII. So this proper geodesic space of ours has or admits a local QII if there are these constants um, with the following property. So any short enough Lipschitz curve, Lipschitz loop, so short enough means that length uh, at most this L0, uh, is the trace of some Sobolev map which has this area control. So this means that when you look at this Lipschitz curve um, and look at the, the, the area minimizer spanning it, um, you, you will get a quadratic upper bound on, on such um, yeah, feelings of gamma. And this is, I guess, um, was a little bit talked about in, in um, the previous talk as well, or a previous talk as well. Only here we are really interested in in taking small loops, not not big loops. Uh, so this, of course, does not need to be true for any big loop. Uh, but yes, we require it here for for small enough loops, Lipschitz curves. Okay, so the way to think about this is that. Okay, so all smooth objects more or less have it, compact manifolds have it, and moreover, you can glue to smooth manifolds in a certain way. So this, this example here on the left hand uh, will have um, a local QII, in fact, maybe even a global one. Uh, but what this condition prevents is cusps, for example. So this thing on the left hand side doesn't have it, and it also prevents uh, holes of arbitrarily small size so, for example, if you glued together uh, a decreasing sequence of tori or something, where the where the diameter of the tori goes to zero, then that space you can I guess you can maybe make it compact or maybe not. I'm not sure, but it will nevertheless uh, not have this this local QII because you have smaller and smaller loops that in fact have no filling, and in particular, then you cannot have this uh, area ST. Okay, and now we come to the formulation of 
the plateau Douglas problem in this singular metric setting. So this is not yet the homotopic uh, problem, but this is the result of, of Martin and Stefan. So you take uh, K disjoint Jordan curves in, in an ambient space, which admits this local QII and satisfies this uh, Douglas condition, right? So the Douglas condition, of course, now with when I, since I introduced the necessary notions, uh, you can define the, the the Douglas condition just in the same way as you defined it in the classical setting in a formal way. So if the Douglas condition is satisfied, then there exists a map, a Sobolev map spanning gamma uh, of minimal area. So the area of U, so the infimum here in this A is attained. So remember A was the infimal area of Sobolev of infimal area of Sobolev maps spanning gamma. Um, and moreover, there exists is the Riemannian metric so that U is infinitesimally isotropic with respect to U. Okay, so this is the analogous statement of, of the, the classical Plateau Douglas um, solution. And um, so th this still requires kind of more work, but under these assumptions, this map will be locally held or continuous in the interior. Well, it will be quasi conformal, that doesn't require much more work. And belongs to a higher order Sobolev space. Uh, well, so Sobolev space with um, W1P, where P is strictly bigger than, than two. Um, and in fact, uh, Martin with um, so Kreutz Fitchi also extended this to to proper to any proper geodesic spaces. So you can drop the local QII. But in this case, you cannot expect, so the, the statement will still be true, uh, even the infinitesimal isotropy, even without this local QII. But in that case, none of these other things uh, are necessarily true. Well, quasi-conformality will be true, but the Hölder continuity and belonging to a higher order Sobolev space or higher exponent Sobolev space uh, will not be true. And in, in particular, these area minimizers, even though they're infinitesimally isotropic, won't in general have any better regularity than just being Sobolev. And all right, so I guess let's have a break now. I mean, we're having a break, right? Great. So uh, with this, we move to the, the homotopic variant now of the plateau Douglas problem in the metric setting. So what's the, what's the difference here? Imagine again, once again, the example with the cylinder and uh, X being just a torus. Um, so this is actually all classical, right? Torus, uh, smooth, compact manifold. And imagine your gamma is given by these two curves here. So now in contrast to the other picture I drew, uh, these are closer together. So it makes a difference whether you go around like this or like this, the areas will be different. But imagine uh, you know, you're asked to find the area minimizer uh, spanning these curves. So of course it will be this, the gray area here. So you map this boundary component to this and this boundary component to this and you're done. That's not unique, but it's uh, a possible thing. But imagine you want to moreover control the topology of your minimizing map as well. So what you do is you start with, um, with some other map, phi, and you want to find a, a minimizer that somehow shares the topology of phi. So let phi be the one which actually maps the first here the first uh, boundary component here, or the number one that I yeah, wrote like that, to this curve, and then it wraps the tor the cylinder around the longer edge, the long well the longer root, and then ends up here. So now, obviously, filling the curve like this, I mean, filling the, the yeah like this, uh, will not share any topology. I mean, will not share the topology of this file. 
so this will not be homo uh, ho this will not be homotopic um, in fact they will not even induce the same uh, action on the fundamental group because this map in fact uh, uh, reverses the orientation of these curves but what you can do on the other hand is imagine keeping this boundary component fixed and grabbing the second one and um, and uh, enlarging it and and so enlarging it and moving it to the other side so then you could still obtain an area minimizer which now maps this curve to this curve and then kind of goes backwards and map maps this curve to this to that curve so this would still be a solution to the plato douglas problem um, and that map would induce the same action on the fundamental group as phi but it still of course would not be homotopic to phi because to be homotopic you really have to go around this way so in fact phi is the area minimizer in its own homotopy class because yeah you, you're forcing yeah the phi to go the, the, the area minimizer to go around this way the same way as phi if you want it to be homotopic um and as i said before you can still find an area minimizer uh which induces the same action as, as the phi star on fundamental groups and so this shows that all these problems are um, are different in general. So now you might hope, okay, um, let's look for area minimizers in a homotopy class. Unfortunately, that's not always possible. The key is this second uh, fundament, uh, second ho homotopy group. So imagine your space is the one that we already saw a little bit. So this uh, gluing of S2 and a disk on the South Pole and your map phi is as follows. So you map a smaller disk, you wrap it around here so that this boundary here all gets mapped to the South Pole. And then you simply continue radially uh, to the boundary curve gamma here. So this, this curve here is, is gamma, which is the a curve that you want to span. And uh, so this pi here just uh, then denotes the projection map, which simply maps all of this disk to the to the South Pole and, and does nothing else. So this is a projection. And now imagine you had an area minimizer here, uh, homotopic to phi. So first of all, any map homotopic to phi relative to the boundary is going to have to be surjective. So it will the image will cover all of the space. Um, and if you have an infinitesimally isotropic area minimizer, then it will turn out that when you post compose it with this projection, you get a map that is uh, an area minimizer and therefore also a energy minimizer because in this, in this, um, a smooth setting, this infinitesimal isotropy will imply conformality. So the area and energy of that map will be the same. So this V will be a harmonic map from the closed disk to S2, which is so harmonic in the interior and the boundary values are constant. But now there's a um, result of Lemaire, which says that any such harmonic map, so a harmonic map from the unit disk to S2, which is constant on the boundary, has to be constant. So therefore, V has to, to, to be identically the South Pole. Of course, that is a contradiction with the fact that U should be projective. Because if V is in the South Pole, then it means that the image of U must lie in this disk, so it, it couldn't cover this part. Um, yes, so no hope to solve uh, this 
in, in homotopy classes. And once more, the key here is that this space has non-trivial second fundamental group because it, it contains the sphere somehow. So what we want to do is uh, define this notion of one homotopy, which is turns out to be much better for, for this problem. And to define that, I will you know, explain uh, well, explain it and explain what triangulations are. So for, for me now, uh, a tri triangulation is just a C1 homeomorphism from a cell complex K to, to M. So here C1 means that so the cell complex consists of, um, of uh, some polytopes, well, triangles, I guess, but actually we don't need them to be triangles. And uh, the restriction of the map onto each of those has to be C1 and also the restriction to any lower dimensional um, skeleton or edge has to be C1. Okay, so now denote by K superscript one, the, the one skeleton of K. Um, now there, there is a, a part of the one skeleton which gets mapped under H to the boundary homeomorphically, right? So this, this we will denote by boundary of K and it will be a subset of the one skeleton because this boundary is the one, a one dimensional object, right? And uh, therefore there, there will be, so this will contain just some edges and, and vertices. And um, now I say that if I have two maps from the one skeleton to X, both of which uh, weekly, so both of which span gamma in the sense that the restrictions to this boundary of K are weak reparameterizations of gamma, uh, we say that they are homotopic relative to gamma. Uh, if there exists a homotopy between them, such that at each intermediate time parameter, this, this uh, HT also spans gamma in that its restriction to the boundary is also a weak re-parameterization re of gamma. So this, this must happen for all the intermediate um, times. And for notational purposes, uh, we denote by this uh, row bracket sub gamma, the homotopy class relative to gamma of, of a given map. Okay, I didn't draw a picture here. Well, well hopefully this is a, yeah, it's a, maybe a bit abstract, but um, I, I will have a picture of what's going on with the one skeleton a bit later on. Though I'm sure you can, maybe many of you have, uh, are familiar with that. So, we're going to define one homotopy for Sobolev maps. So first thing to note is that Sobolev map isn't continuous, right? Even if it spans the boundary, meaning that the boundary values are essentially continuous, the map itself doesn't need to be continuous. So talking about the homotopy class of U doesn't really make sense, not directly at least. So it turns out that when, when you do this restriction to, to uh, one skeleton, uh, you can pose a, a well-defined definition of, uh, of the one homotopy class for solar maps. And uh, yeah, so what you do is you take a triangulation and, uh, and then uh, restrict you to the one skeleton or the image of the one skeleton. And in fact, because once again, we're talking about Sobolev maps, so they don't need even be defined here on this lower dimensional set, you have to perturb it a little bit. And um, then you take the homotopy class of the restriction. And this is uh, again, actually a, a classical notion. So it was done uh, by, Maybe I think the first one might have been Burstall. Uh, there are also some related works of Shen Yao, uh, where they show that actually a Sobolev map 
induces a well-defined homomorphism between the first fundamental groups. But anyway, Burstall, White, in the, so these are in the 80s, late 80s, and then uh, Hang Lin uh, a bit later. Um, okay. And uh, so the theorem here we proved uh, is that a map spanning gamma has a well-defined homotopy class. So, so you, you take any triangulation and there exists a homotopy class of maps from, from the one skeleton to X uh, that span gamma. And this homotopy class has the following property. So if U is continuous, then you simply take, and the homotopy class is simply given by, you know, post the restriction of the composition to the one skeleton. So this is how you would define the, the one homotopy class of a continuous map. Anyway, this is, this is gonna always be well-defined. But for Sobolev maps, we cannot define it simply like this because uh, the object on the right-hand side needs the map on the right hand side need not be well defined or even if it is need not be continuous um so if u is continuous then we have this and then if we have uh, another sobolev map spanning gamma and we have that these homotopy classes one homotopy classes agree then they will agree for actually any other triangulation as well so that, that is not something I will actually explain in this talk, but uh, it, it shows that this, this notion of being one homotopic um, does not depend on your choice of triangulation. So if you find one triangulation, uh, then, then it will work for any triangulation. And uh, so we say that two maps, two Sobola maps are one homotopic if there is some triangulation for which these ho one homotopic classes agree. Okay, and um, so then we also say that a Sobolev map is one homotopic to a continuous map if the one homotopy class of the Sobolev map agrees with the one homotopy class of the continuous map, where the, for continuous maps you can simply define it like this. Okay. Is this map connected with the trace? The, the map is, so, um, it will include is the, the trace uh, to of uh, of the, on the one skeleton so so the the trace is part of the data because uh, here remember that we are only considering maps which span gamma which means that the trace is essentially a continuous function or map that parametrizes this gamma so the traces will always have to be some parameterizations of gamma and uh, I mean, we want to do this because we want to consider one homotopy relative to gamma. So we want, because we want to, um, yeah, so we want to preserve th this property that the maps span the, the given boundary curve. So we are defining a, rel an, a relative notion of homotopy. But note that this is, Different from saying that the maps are one homotopic relative to the boundary, which is a classical notion you can also define, because in that case, you would, you would demand that the two maps agree on the boundary. That, like, um, you know, when you have two curves that are endpoint homotopic, means that they are homotopic, so they, they keep the endpoints fixed, both of them, and they are homotopic through maps which keep the endpoints fixed. So this is kind of similar, but we, we don't require that the, the restrictions to the boundary are kept fixed. We allow them to be like moved somehow, but we require that they still, however they're moved, they still parameterize this boundary curve. I mean, this curve curves gamma. But and um, what I was asking was, um, so if I see K as a, as a union of triangles, then mm -hmm. on each triangle, I can consider the trace of the map. Right? So oh, I, I see. Yes, yes. So that is actually one way to to make sense of yeah. So that's kind of one way to um 
to, to define. The, the problem is, so when you do it like that, if you just, so you can look at the trace, so you can take a triangulation and then look at the trace, that's true, but there's no guarantee in general that the trace will be continuous. So there, for, to, to obtain that, you have to move the triangulation a little bit, you have to kind of wiggle it um, to, to obtain that. And here is actually <clears throat> my attempt at explaining what is happening. So, um, so you have, so this is now part of the manifold. Here is a boundary component or part of it. And the blue, if you can see it, is a part of the one skeleton of some given triangulation. And now you, so this H uh, restricted to the one skeleton, um, yeah, is, is kind of drawn like this here. And I didn't quite draw it here, but this is also definitely part of the, uh, of the triangulation. And in fact, this guy here is the image of part of the boundary of K. Now, what can happen is that this composition is not necessarily well defined or is not continuous, as I said. But what do we do? So we cook up a smooth family of diffeomorphisms, uh, phi xi for some parameter xi, uh, so that phi zero is just the identity. And uh, then when we consider these new triangulations obtained by post-composing our original one with, with um, a diffeomorphism like this, um, they satisfy this kind of um, inequality. So when you integrate over xi, the energies of these compositions restricted to K1 minus the boundary now for reasons that, let me see if I can explain later. Um, you, you can bound this by some constant times the energy of the map itself. Now, um, and this constant, yes, will, will depend on the triangulation, the original triangulation you chose in general, but uh, will not depend on, on you. It will also depend on the Riemannian metric. Um, now, wh what does this mean? So this is a, a kind of um, thing that I try to draw here in red. So these phi xi's, they kind of sweep out a positive area around these blue edges. And so then when you integrate this, uh, it's kind of like, I mean, you're kind of integrating the energy of, of your map in these small strips. And so, I mean, in this, yeah, the, the, the strip in between these red lines, right? And that, because that has positive area, this, this will be, you know, bounded by, by the energy of your map. But you, you have to be careful here at the boundary because uh, however you wiggle your triangulation with a, with a diffeomorphism, that will not produce any positive area thing here because what it will do is the diffeomorphisms will, will just flip, will rotate the boundary components a little bit. So, you know, you might go a bit this way, or a bit that way, but you will never sweep positive area there. So you have to be a bit careful. That's why here you have to take out the boundary. Anyway, what this means is that um, for almost every xi, this guy is in, uh, in this sub of space W12 over this one dimensional uh, K1 with the boundary removed. Now, because you are Sobolev 1, 2 on a one dimensional space, you have the Sobolev embedding, which tells you that in fact, these maps are um, agree almost everywhere with a Helder continuous map even. So they are in particular essentially continuous. So for almost every Xi, these guys will be essentially continuous when you restrict to K1 minus the boundary. This is what you get from this. And um, now because you already assumed that when you restrict to the boundary, 
the, the boundary is essentially continuous and a parameterization of this gamma, uh, the, the, there's a little argument where you have to argue that actually the, um, the so, so, you, so you can glue these together and the, so you have this guy which is continuous and the restriction of this to the boundary which is continuous. So you glue these together and for almost every psi, the, the gluings will match so that this guy is going to be continuous. And um, so this you can all do without uh, the local QII, but for this next step that unfortunately I'm not really gonna explain much, uh, you, you need the local QII. So uh, when you take, so you have this null set here for which all these stuff holds. Um, so there is a null set so that for all Xi and Z outside that null set, these restrictions uh, are continuous and they are homotopic relative to the boundary. So somehow this one Xi could be this outermost red line here and the other Zeta could be this one here. And uh, the idea is that somehow because they're very close together, the, the images will end up being homotopic. So you're wiggling by very little. So you're not, uh, yeah, changing changing the this these much in terms of homotopy. Okay, and now what we do is we define this one homotopy class to be the one homotopy class of this composition for any xi for almost any xi because this bulletin point above tells you that this is not um, dependent on the, on, the, on the xi you choose, essentially not dependent. Okay, so that was a very rough sketch of uh, how you define the one homotopy for Sobolev maps. So now let's assume that uh, we kind of have an idea how that works. And um, let's go back to primary reductions. So remember maybe from the introduction uh, that a primary reduction of a surface was this other surface M star obtained by you know, cutting along a curve and gluing disks. So here we want to uh, preserve the topological information given by the map phi, some map phi that is given to, given to us. So, so you, you give me a map phi from M to X, which spans gamma. And now I want to consider the pair M phi. And um, I say that another pair M star phi star is a primary reduction of this pair where M star is exactly as before. So a surface obtained by cutting uh, along a, no, a simple non-contractible loop in the interior and then attaching these disks to the boundary components. And moreover, this phi star should be a continuous map from M star to X, which agrees with phi on the parts uh, that they have in common. So notice that this M minus alpha is, is here seen as a subset of M star. And this is uh, legitimate because we obtained M star by, you know, uh, attaching something to this. So this is a subset of M star. It's just kind of, in the picture it looks different because you kind of view it with a different metric. Okay, and we define the, the similar notions here. So instead of uh, A M gamma here, we write A M phi. And notice that this phi contains the information of, of the boundary curve. So it contains this, this uh, curves gamma somehow. And uh, you define this just to be the infimal area of maps spanning gamma, which are one homotopic to, to this given map phi. And then you define the comparison area where you 
Uh, instead, look at how little area or much area you have to spend to span gamma with um, maps that are homotopic to this phi star for any primary reduction. Okay. And not surprisingly, perhaps this pair M phi satisfies the homotopic Douglas condition if the so the if it's strictly better to fill in with maps from the full surface than it is to fill uh, it from with a some from a map with a map from some uh, primary reduction. Okay. And uh, finally, I'm able to formulate the main result here, uh, which is very analogous, of course, to, to for example, a uh, result of Fitzy and Wenger. So um, suppose X admits a local QII, and we are given a continuous map, map which spans gamma. And this pair M phi satisfies the homotopic Douglas condition. So then we can always find a continuous subalert map spanning gamma, which is one homotopic to phi relative to gamma, and has attains the infimum of the areas. So this is an area minimizer. And moreover, we find a Riemannian metric so that U is infinitesimally isotropic with respect to this metric. So this is in complete analogy with, um, with uh, the previous result. And even the so the difference to the classical result is that here we uh, replace this by infinitesimally isotropic the, the requirement that you be conformal. And if the second fundamental group of the target space vanishes, then in fact this area minimizer of ours, which is in the one homotopic class a priori uh, is in fact homotopic and um, this last fact here is uh, follows from from a general principle that under this condition any maps that are one homotopic are also homotopic so the converse is always true because if you have a homotopy, you can simply restrict it to the one skeleton and you, and you get a homotopy of the restrictions to the one skeleton. But under this condition, you have the opposite inclusion as well. So this is somehow uh, explains a little bit the, um, yeah, the role played by the second fundamental group here. Okay, so once again, we get uh, more regularity from this. So these maps are again locally held in, in the interior. They are quasi conformal and they belong to this uh, higher order sub F space. Something I should have maybe pointed out earlier the, a local sub F space. So the, the, the minimal gradient doesn't have global higher integrability, but local higher integrability. This, by the way, is once again, by Sobolev embedding theorem, already enough to give you uh, this Hölder continuity. But, uh, but by work of um, Litzak and Wenger, you you get you, you can uh, produce the Hölder exponents, which are often or which are generally better than the Hölder exponent you get from the Sobolev embedding here, and are related to this um, optimal constant in the QII inequality. And um, one other point to make, which kind of ties this to, to, to the slides in the very beginning, which is homotopic variants of Yost and Lemaire. So the injectivity, so if you have a map which induces a, a, an injective homomorphism between the fundamental groups, then the Douglas condition is in fact always satisfied. And um, why is that true? Just shortly. Um, so, what, if when you have a primary reduction, 
the existence of this map phi star in particular implies that if alpha is the loop that you're cutting along to obtain this m star, then phi composed with alpha has to be contractible um, because phi star extends it to the disk, so it's contractible. Um, now, if phi star or the induced homomorphism by phi is injective, then you start with a non-contractible loop alpha, which defines an element here, and you map it here. And this injectivity tells you that this, this uh, composition will never be um, uh, homotopically trivial, never be contractible. So that means that you don't have any primary reductions in this case. So this doubtless condition then simply becomes that the infimal area, uh, this AM phi, uh, simply has to be less, strictly less than infinity, so it has to be finite. And then this you can uh, kind of do by hand, show that indeed, if you have any continuous map spanning gamma homotopy phi, then, then actually you already, you also have a sobolet map. Doing that, so this will be finite. And then, then you obtain the homotopic Douglas condition from that. Uh, this point I will return to. So uh, unlike the result of uh, Martin and Stefan, this does not remain true anymore if, if you remove the hypothesis of local QI. Okay, so let me try to outline the proof here a little bit. Uh, so the idea is very taken from, from the proof of uh, Fitzi and Wenger. So, and it's kind of like a direct uh, method of calculus of variation. So you take a minimizing sequence for the area, right? And then you want to bound the energies, but area doesn't bound the energy in general. So what you do is you use uh, Morris epsilon conformality lemma, the, a variant that was again proved by Fitzi and Wenger. So there is a Riemannian metric uh, for which this UN is kind of almost conformal in the sense that the energy of each map um, with respect to this metric is at most the area plus some small term epsilon, which you can choose this arbitrarily. Um, and note now that the homotopic Douglas condition tells you that you can actually choose epsilon uh, small enough so that these epsilon plus area ends will always be strictly smaller than this uh, A star. Because you assume that A is smaller than A star. Now these and this area, these tend to A. Uh, eventually you can yeah, assume that they are all strictly smaller and then you can choose this epsilon so that this holds. So what we want to do is, so we, now we have the sequence of metrics as well as maps. And we want to um, uh, use Mumford compactness to pass to, to a limit of metrics, to produce a limiting metric. Uh, if we can do that, then we can apply the relic conduct of compactness to get because in that, if we can establish this, then uh, we have a, a uniform energy bound on the energies of these maps UN with respect to G, in fact. Uh, and then relic Kondrachov implies that there is a L2 limit U. And what this, what this, you know, um, forces us to do is to apply any Mumford compactness, we have to bound the systole of the metric. So the systole is um, the minimal length of a geodesic for, for this metric. And here the relative refers to the fact that, so, sorry, this is a, the minimal length of a non-contractible geodesic. Uh, and the relative refers to the fact that when you have a boundary, 
you don't only look at closed geodesics, uh, but you allow geodesics that start and end at boundary components. And the second issue uh, that we then have to face is once we have this uh, L2 limit, uh, we have to prove that the limit stays in the homotopy class. So these are the two things we have to take care of. Okay, so here's the picture trying to explain the, how you prove the sister lower bound. So by the way, both these issues you... Well, okay, so in, in this, the, the homotopic Douglas condition is what um, yields this lower bound. <clears throat> So you imagine that the systole, you don't have a, lo a, a lower bound on it, but that uh, it becomes very, very small, right? And let's say it's realized by this curve beta. And here, by the way, I drew the scenario where the realizing curve, where the realizing geodesic uh, indeed is not a closed geodesic loop, but uh, starts from a boundary point and ends up at the same boundary point. And now if this is small enough, uh, what happens is these two points will be very close. And because the boundary values of our map UN parameterize this gamma, um, one of these segments will get mapped to a long part of the, the gamma and the other one, which here I drew to be this, will get mapped to a very short part of the segment. Um, so here I kind of try to draw the, the peak, I mean, yeah, the image curves. So this beta is, uh, the image is drawn here like this. And if this is very small, then you can prove that actually here you have to wiggle, you have to consider some parallel curve to beta, uh, but you can prove that this, the length of the image curve is also very small. So you can control it by the length of beta times the energy of the map. Uh, so you can make it very small as well. So it will turn out that this is very small. And then one of these um, segments of the boundary component will get mapped to a very short segment as well. So gamma, if gamma prime denotes the image of this lowercase gamma prime, uh, this the length of this image will be short. So the, this here, is now part of the curve gamma or this this joint of k uh, jordan curves gamma and the rest might go somewhere here but it's not relevant for us so that means that we have a very short uh curve now because this curve is very short using the local qii we can fill it essentially using the local qii we can feel it. Um, so we can, in fact, you know, find a, a map from the disk which spans this and has very small area. So smaller than you know some constant times the length of this squared, which we can make arbitrarily small. So now. First of all, what this means is that we take some, we, we take a curve alpha and cut along it. Uh, we, we choose this curve alpha to be on the same side as this gamma prime. So if gamma prime was instead here, then we would cur cut along a curve from here. But now we choose this. And um, the fact that this curve here can be filled means that actually the concatenate the, the 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 image of this concatenation uh is is uh, contractible so in particular the image of this concatenation is also contractible 
and um, we can construct the primary reduction by yeah, cutting along this and then attaching these two disks, right? So now we define our U, uh, so then we define this phi star by some filling here because these curves are contractible, we can fill them somehow. And we define this map uh, UN star, which is going to be the same as UN on these parts, but then on these red parts and the caps, we have to do something else. Um, here we identify this part with a disk and map. So we define the U star from, from this here to be the, this filling. And here on the other disk, we basically do the analogous thing. So uh, there's a small annulus here, which you have to map to map this small annulus to this part so that you have the same, so that the boundaries match up. And then uh, from there, you, you use the same feeling here. So you have defined a map U and star uh, from this a sublet map U and star from this uh, primary reduction M star. And uh, because these fillings had very small area and this annulus here has just the area that this guy has, the area of U and star is uh, very much, very, very slightly more than, than this uh, area of UN. So we still are below A star. Um, and now, because this UN star is defined to agree with UN on these parts, uh, it's a lemma that one has to prove, but this UN star will be one homotopic to this phi star. And this is essentially because UN star agrees with UN on these parts and UN is homotopic to phi, one homotopic to phi. And these parts kind of don't matter for the one homotopy because uh, they are simply a Jordan domain. So you can always find a triangulation where the one skeleton doesn't go in these parts. So then when you have that the maps agree on this and this, so this and this, the, the restrictions to the one skeleton uh, won't, won't see that the maps are different here. And so they will be one homotopic to this phi star. Okay, so what that then means is that this area phi, uh, this area of U n star should be smaller than um, a star, strictly smaller, but on the other hand, uh, this was the infimum of areas of all maps, one homotopic to a phi star in, for some primary reduction. So now uh, we, we reach, reach a contradiction because this guy should be at most the area of U n star. Okay, so that was a very rough sketch of uh, how to obtain this lower bound. So we assume that this beta was the length of beta was very small and that enabled us to construct uh, a primary reduction using the fact that this image curve was so short that we can fill it and then define these maps and th that, that led to a contradiction. <laughs> and then we have a similar um, argument to, to uh, prove that in fact, so, by the way, here we establish the lower bound on the systole, on the relative systole, and um, uh, that means that we can apply this Mumford compactness. So we pass to a subsequence and uh, limiting Riemannian metric G. And then, uh, so now we have uh, this metric G and our sequence UN, which is energy bounded with respect to G. So we can pass to a subsequence by relic contract, so we can pass the subsequence uh, given uh, to, to obtain a limit map. And what we want to prove is that this limit map stays in the, the one homotopy class. So the first thing to prove is that the limit map even spans gamma, because if it doesn't span gamma, then it, of course, cannot be one homotopic relative to gamma 
to anything because it doesn't span gamma. So to do that, we have to prove that traces of these maps UN are, um, are equicontinuous. And so to save time, because I'm basically out of it, let me just say that the idea is very similar. Um, you assume that they were that they would not be equicontinuous, and that means that some short boundary arc of some boundary component gets mapped to a relatively large uh, part of gamma, and then that in turn means that the longer part here gets mapped to a very short. Uh, part of, of gamma. So that would be this thing here that I drew. And then once again, we construct the primary reduction using the fact that um, we can fill this red part here. So what I did is um, use the Quran Lebesgue lemma to come up with a short uh, curve beta connecting not necessarily the endpoints of the segment, but close by points that encircle the, the short segment. And I then am able to construct this primary reduction where now the primary reduction is a disjoint union of a disk plus the rest of the surface where you uh, put a cap on one of the boundary components. And um, so I will not go through the, the details there, but the, the, the crucial thing again is to be able to fill this. And uh, this you do uh, by using the local QII uh, and this counter assumption of non equicontinuity. So the counter assumption allows you to say that this image curve here will be very short, and then you can fill it, and then you can define the maps uh, in a similar fashion as before, and you get this contradiction. Okay. So then what's left is to prove that. Uh, this limiting map. Now we know that it um, spans gamma, and then we have to show that it is um, actually also one homotopic. Right. And uh, this is given by this stability of, of one homotopy. So whenever you have uh, a sequence of maps spanning gamma that are one homotopic to this given map and have this uh, energy, uniform energy bound, then any L2 limit will stay in the homotopy class. And the idea is this, so you fix a triangulation um, and this here uh, inequality by using this um, family of diffeomorphisms give you that, uh, so there is some Xi here, actually there are like kind of almost every Xi where this happens for a subsequence and um, that means, again, by the Sobolev embedding and the equicontinuity at the boundary, uh, means that for that Xi and that subsequence, aha, here should be UN composed with H Xi, is uh, equicontinuous. So then the limit, then with, since it's equicontinuous, it will have a limit which, since the L2 limit of U of UN is U, that limit will agree almost everywhere with the um, restriction of the limiting map. And now because, so we basically have, so here should be U sub N. The, these converge uniformly to this guy. And that will give us that, uh, because they're uniformly close, there will be also one homotopic relative to gamma. Okay. And, um, so then there are a few steps to complete the proof of this, of the solvability of the homotopic plateau problem. So now we obtained an area minimizer in the one homotopic class. Now, now we uh, apply kind of the same procedure again, to obtain an infinitesimally isotropic minimizer. But what we do is we consider all area minimizers and in that class, we minimize the energy. And then, so you use the same argument to see, show that there is an energy minimizer in that class as well. 
and uh, then it's it's a work of of um, Alexandra and Stefan, which shows that an energy minimizer in the class of area minimizers has to be infinitesimally isotropic, and that gives you this uh, the map. And the map, the limiting map G given by the man for compactness somehow is um, is uh, will give you this existence of the Riemannian metric. And the last thing I want to say um, is that unlike um, the result of um, Martin and Stefan, this, this existence of minimizers fails if you don't assume the local QII. So I don't actually know if you can give a, a def definition of one homotopy for Sobolev maps, because the definition was already using the local or the fact that the definition is well posed was using the one homotopy, um, the, sorry, the local QII. Uh, so I don't know if you can circumvent that problem, but even if you can, the stability of the one homotopy classes will fail. And here's a example. So you start with um, the this kind of um, surface of revolution of, of this wildly oscillating sine one over T uh, graph, but this guy, and you group it with uh, the metric from R3, but now this guy will not be geodesic at all. So you have to add some line segments to make it quasi-geodesic, meaning quasi-convex, and then you then it means that it's by Lipschitz it's equivalent, equivalent to a geodesic space. And now this guy will fail the local QII. Uh, and you can see that it will also fail the stability of the one homotopy classes by, by considering this example. So here, this example doesn't have, there's no boundary involved, but it nevertheless shows the idea. So your surface is just a torus. So first, what you do is you, you know, um, project the torus just to a, to a copy of S1 by, you know, uh, projecting one of these S1s to, to a point. And then you consider maps U1, U3, U2, U3, and so on. So you map this circle to this here, and then to this, and then to this, and so on. Um, so all these maps are one homotopic to each other because you can always you know, go um, over these valleys, however many there are, to, to glide one circle here to the, to the next. And now these also all have uh, energy bound because, I mean, they're just some Lipschitz, equilipsitz maps, actually, I guess. Um, but the L2 limit is a map here on the disk. And um, because you were more and more widely oscillating here, there's no way to homotopy this back here. In fact, uh, yeah, there's nothing you can do. And, and this limit map, is, is contractible actually, whereas these guys are not contractible. So the limiting map falls out of the one homotopy class if you, and this can happen if you do not assume the local QII. Okay, and with that, um, I apologize for going over time and uh, thank you for your attention.